Hello lovelies, my name is Caitlin and welcome to another episode of True Crime with Caitlin. Today we're going to be talking about a man whose crimes were so heinous that he was dubbed the Monster of Worcester. This is the case of David McGreevy and the murder of the Ralph children. David Anthony McGreevy was born in 1951 in Southport, which is a seaside town in Merseyside. He was the second oldest of six children from Bella and Thomas McGreevy. The McGreevy family were as normal as any other. They were close-knit and likely because he had so many younger siblings, David had developed a fondness of children. He had a great relationship with his siblings. Thomas worked as a sergeant within the Royal Signals and I am terrible when it comes to anything to do with the army and terminology and stuff like that so I did have to look up what the Royal Signals were and according to the British Army website quote, the Royal Signals are leaders in IT, cyber and telecommunications providing battle winning communications to every part of the army. The Royal Signals are trained to become experts in engineering and operating systems, networks and cyber equipment. Because of Thomas's work, the family would often move, living in all different army bases in all different countries, and the children would attend army school. One of the favourite countries that the family lived in was Germany. Here they would take advantage of the beautiful outdoors, they would go on many bike rides and hikes, they would have picnics, they even enjoyed skiing too, and they'd done all this together as a family. Growing up, David was a pretty unremarkable, normal kid. He very rarely got into trouble. Bella would only really be able to recall one time when he got into proper serious trouble. The family were living in Cardiff at the time and David had stolen all of Bella's shopping money and spent it on taking a trip to Liverpool. That was the only memorable time that David had ever really gotten wrong. After finishing school in 1967, David pursued his childhood dream and enlisted into the Royal Navy. Thomas wasn't sure how David would get on. Of course, he had already sort of experienced a life within the forces because of his father's career, but Thomas wasn't sure how dedicated David would actually be. Nevertheless, David enlisted and he would go on to be stationed at the naval base in Portsmouth where he joined his first ship, the HMS Eagle. While at RNAS Brodie in Pembrokeshire, David worked as a steward in the mess hall and while on one of his ships, I believe, he noticed that an officer had left out one of their books and inside they had scribbled down David's name. When David saw this, he thought that this indicated that they were either going to switch his jobs or move him or that he was once again in trouble. David would find himself at the centre of a lot of bother on the ship quite often. The Navy is a very disciplined setting and David, who was described as arrogant and cocky, but was also just a teenager, would receive many telling-offs and disciplinaries just because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He had also begun drinking and once he had a drink, he would turn nasty and became impulsive. After he saw his name scribbled down inside of this officer's book, David went off and got drunk and in this drunken state, he broke into an officer's office in the middle of the night and set fire to a bin which was filled with papers. He reported the fire at around 2.30am and when he was questioned about it, he tried to play it off as an innocent mistake, saying it was all an accident and that he mustn't have properly put out his cigarette before dropping it into the bin and that's what caused the fire. This was of course a lie and everyone saw straight through it. David was sent to the court-martial, which is just like the army's own court, and here he was sentenced to 90 days detention due to negligence. He was also put through psychiatric evaluation, and even to this day, the results of those evaluations have never been shared with anyone. Wouldn't those be interesting to look at now? In 1971, a now 19 or 20-year-old David is stationed at Portsmouth Dockyard after completing a tour of duty upon the HMS Eagle, where he went to the Far East. 
While in Portsmouth, he was introduced to a young woman named Mary Allen by her brother who worked with David. They would write bi-weekly letters to each other, each one getting longer and longer and intensifying in affection. David and Mary would finally properly meet face to face in April of 1971 and it was love at first sight. Only a week later, David would get down on one knee and asked Mary to be his wife. When David shared the news of his engagement with his family, it wasn't really celebrated. Bella didn't like Mary because she thought that she was a hypochondriac. Mary had some health issues mainly centred around her spine and she was almost always in pain and her condition meant that it was actually very highly likely that she could become paralysed one day. But like I say, Bella did not believe that Mary had a health condition but she thought that Mary played up to it and made it out as if it was worse than what it actually was. Despite his mother's disapproval, David continued his engagement relationship with Mary. He was absolutely infatuated, besotted, head over heels in love with her. The couple were able to spend the odd long weekend together throughout the summer when David had some time off and they really valued this time spent together. When they weren't able to see each other physically, they would continue to write letters to each other and by now they were like six pages long and described as very intense. In August 1971, David's lifelong ambition of a long, successful career in the Royal Navy came to an end when he was discharged. He returned to Worcester, where his parents were living, and showed up at their door, telling them, quote, I'm out, before dropping his bags to the floor. For the next couple of months, he would bounce from job to job, going from working as a chef to labouring, but he never stuck at any of them. His attitude never really improved, so if it wasn't his arrogance that got him sacked, it was his fondness of alcohol or turning up to work drunk. David decided that instead of trying to look for and maintain a new job, that he was going to pour all of his energy into what he considered the only good thing in his life, and that was his fiancée, Mary. He wanted to get going planning their wedding and he wanted the wedding to reflect his love for Mary so he was wanting like a big, over the top, traditional, expensive white wedding whereas Mary didn't. She was totally fine with something more toned down, something that they could actually afford and she suggested a registry office wedding but David said no. He was determined to have the huge wedding that I just described and it was this determination, borderline obsession and him just outright dismissing what Mary wanted that showed Mary a different side to David, a side that she didn't like and so she would actually go on to end their engagement on New Year's Eve 1971. So the beginning of 1972 wasn't going great for David McGreevy. He had lost his job, which was his childhood dream, and was struggling to hold down another. The love of his life had called off their engagement, and now his relationship with his parents was becoming strained. David contributed nothing to the family home. He was unemployed, so he couldn't pay any rent. He wasn't even trying to find a job. He wouldn't even help by doing stuff around the house, like any sort of chores, and eventually the tension in the house became so bad that after a huge argument, he was kicked out by his parents with nowhere to go. David would reach out to an old friend named Clive Ralph and asked him if there was any way that he could lodge with them for a little while until he found somewhere else and got back onto his feet and Clive happily agreed to help an old friend. Clive had no idea that this one act of kindness, this decision to help someone in their time of need, would end up destroying and changing his own life forever. Clive Ralph lived at number 8 Gillam Street in Worcester with his heavily pregnant wife Dorothy who just went by her middle name Elsie and their two young children, three-year-old Paul Kenneth and one-year-old Dawn Maria. They only lived in a small two-bedroom terraced home but Clive wasn't going to see one of his friends out on the street so he offered David to share a bedroom with Paul. Clive worked extremely hard to try his best to provide for his little family whom he adored. He worked with his own dad, lorry driving, so his shifts would often be long and sometimes he could be gone for a couple of days, so really, David moving in and being an extra pair of hands to help was really beneficial for Clive and Elsie. 
People would describe David as almost like a second father to the children. He had a great bond with them, he would play with them, he would playfully tease them. When Samantha Jane was born in September 1972, he stepped in caring for her too. He would rock at a settler and he would feed her. And like I say, he was described as very father-like. Elsie even recalled a time when David had told her off because she was being too strict with Paul. He seemingly loved this role and being around the children was never like a chore to David. He actually bonded so well with them that Clive and Elsie were comfortable enough to accept his offer of babysitting for them so that Elsie could go back to work. She and Clive were hoping to move into a bigger home and Elsie being able to work and bring in another wage would really help them achieve this goal much faster and give their children a much better quality of life. Alongside childcare, David would help with little bits around the house, so he'd do bits of cleaning and sometimes he would cook the odd meal and he was able to chip in £6 a week rent because finally he was holding down a job at a nearby factory. The people who lived within the small 10 house cul-de-sac would say that although David came off as a bit of a know-it-all, he seemed a harmless, happy-go-lucky, well-spoken, well-mannered, educated and a likeable man. So very different to how his colleagues on HMS Eagle would describe him. Seemingly, life was really beginning to look up for David. He had found a purpose and he was in an environment where people valued him, really enjoyed his company and maybe even loved him. But this didn't stop him from eventually reverting back to abusing alcohol. Friday the 13th of April 1973 was a very typical day. Elsie had made some dinner for the children who had spent the day relaxing, watching TV and playing with their toys. Paul had been playing with a train set and Dawn with her dollies. After giving the children some dinner, Elsie went and got herself ready and headed out the door to go to work the closing shift at a local pub called the Punchbowl Tavern, leaving Clive with the children. Meanwhile, David was out having drinks at another pub called the Vauxhall Inn. He was there with a friend and they had spent the afternoon playing darts and playing cards and David had had between five and seven pints, so he was quite drunk. Probably just as part of a stupid prank, David dropped his cigarette into one of his friend's pints who did not find it funny. They got into what was described as an altercation and I'm not sure if that was just an argument or if there was some pushing and shoving or even if there was a fully blown fist fight but before it was able to escalate too far Clive had arrived at the Vauxhall Inn to pick up David so that he could come back home to babysit. Clive would leave 8 Gillam Street at around 11pm that night leaving his children tucked up fast asleep in their warm beds to go and pick up Elsie from work while David stayed at home. This was a routine thing because Elsie often worked the closing shift and Clive would go and pick her up. He would arrive at the Punchbowl Tavern just before last orders, he would sit and order himself a pint and he would drink it while waiting for Elsie to finish up. Sometime after Clive left, Samantha, who was now nine months old, awoke crying. Now David was no stranger to a crying infant, he had lived with the Ralphs for a while now so he knew how to soothe or calm down the children. He warmed up a bottle of milk for Samantha and tried to feed her but she was refusing it. Ordinarily, David would persevere until she did take the bottle or he would change her or he would even hold and rock her to calm her down but for some reason, this night was different. Could it have been that David was more intoxicated than usual? Could the altercation with his friend still be chewing at him and making him feel frustrated? Could he have just snapped or was this evil always living within him and waiting to come out? When Samantha continued to cry, David placed his hand over her mouth to try and muffle her, but it would do the opposite. Her crying amplified because even at her young age, she probably began to panic when one of her airways was blocked. Realising that covering her mouth wasn't working, David allegedly proceeded to grab nine-month-old Samantha's legs and continually whacked her body off of the wall, fracturing her skull, which killed her. He then retrieved a razor blade from the bathroom and mutilated her body. 
The noise from this had awoken Dawn and Paul, who, terrified, were screaming in horror. Here was a man that they knew and they trusted, even potentially loved, doing the unthinkable to their baby sister. David would go on to strangle 20-month-old Dawn with his bare hands before using the razor blade to slit her throat. He then used some curtain wire to strangle three-year-old Paul to death. After sadistically murdering all three of the Ralph children, David went down to the basement of their home, collected a pickaxe and mutilated their bodies further. Usually with such heinous crimes like this, the perpetrator will try to conceal evidence, cleaning the crime scene, hiding weapons, disposing of bodies, just trying to hide what they have done, but not David. David seemingly wanted to show off what he had done and one by one he carried the bodies of Paul, Dawn and Samantha out of the home, down to a neighbour's garden and impaled their tiny bodies on an iron fence for all to see and then he just leaves. Neighbours had heard the children either screaming or crying and noticed that the lights within the Ralph home were flickering on and off between the rooms and this was strange and paired with the crying it was so concerning that they contacted the police. Officers promptly arrived and when they entered 8 Gillam Street they were met with blood soaked walls. It was crystal clear that someone had caused great harm inside of this house and with the three children nowhere to be seen there became a sense of urgency. Shortly after, Clive and Elsie pulled into their street to find it flooded with policemen and police cars. They went to approach their home when they were stopped by an officer who told them that they needed to speak to them down at the police station. As awful as it sounds, investigators needed to speak to Clive and Elsie to rule them out as suspects. We like to think that no parents would ever cause harm to their child, but sadly we live in a world where there are Tracy Connollys and Chris Watson. Around the same time that investigators are speaking to Clive and Elsie, other officers are back at Gillam Street searching, trying to find any sign of the children or where they could have gone. Shortly after 1.15am, officers who were outside searching the proximity of the house with their torches would shine their light on an iron fence which had congealed blood on it. Moving the torch up higher would reveal the horrific sight of three young children impaled on the fence. They had finally found Paul, Dawn and Samantha. An experienced officer who was at the scene physically threw up and all of the officers there were left, quote, sick and shaken. Investigators speaking to Clive and Elsie quickly realised that they had no involvement in what happened to their children and they needed to be the ones to break the devastating news that their children had been murdered. Elsie would later recall being told about the murders. Well, as far as I can remember, the police were there and they said that they needed to speak to us at the police station and this is when they told us that there you know there had been a murder but there was an investigation going on and that was as far as i can really remember properly because there was a doctor there at the time so i went hysterical which she would and um he gave me an injection and, you know, I don't really, I never ever went back to the house. I wasn't allowed. So I was screaming, saying that I wanted to go and see my children and things like this, as you would. And that, and they said that we couldn't do that. And what had happened to the children? They just said that there was a murder. They'd been murdered. But they didn't tell me to what extent it had happened. With both parents now ruled out, police focused all of their attention to the only other person from that house, 21-year-old David McGreevy. David McGreevy was quite quickly found by police. He was lingering around the Lansdowne Road area, which wasn't even a five-minute walk away from the crime scene. He was arrested on site at around 3.50am, and the first thing he said was, quote, What's this all about? 
He was taken to the station and questioned, and initially he denied any sort of involvement with the sadistic triple murder. However, after a couple of hours, he broke. David put his head between his knees and began sobbing, saying, quote, It was all too bloody gruesome. It was me, but it wasn't me. How could I do it? He would go on to describe in graphic detail exactly what took place. I couldn't find a full recording or even a transcript of the confession, however I did find the following quotes. When asked about Samantha, he said, I picked her up and tried to nurse her to stop her from crying, but she still would not, so I cut off her breath. He continued on talking about what happened after the murders, saying, Everything just seemed to cave in. I picked up the pickaxe and used it on all of them. I was going to bury them, but I couldn't. I went outside and put them on the fence. All I can hear is kids, kids, fucking kids. David McGreevy would go on to plead guilty to the murders of Paul Kenneth Ralph, Dawn Maria Ralph and Samantha Jane Ralph. His hearing slash trial only lasted a swift eight minutes as he ended a guilty plea and didn't try to claim diminished responsibility or anything like that. On the 30th of July 1973, David was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 20 years to serve. He spent most of his prison time under protection within the Vulnerable Prisoners Unit. Of course, being a child killer made him a target to a lot of the prisoners who may be fathers or grandfathers or uncles or familiar with the heinous crimes. When he wasn't in protection, he would be assaulted, his cell would be trashed with his few belongings, either broken or stolen, his cell would be covered in excrement, so he was almost always put back in the VPU. I did read in one article that he reportedly offered out Ian Brady, Ian Brady being one of the Moors murderers, for some reason David McGreevy wanted to have a fight with him. David was eligible for parole in 1993 and he applied for release, however he was knocked back. Over the years he tried several more times and each time Elsie would push back against his release because obviously she didn't want her children's killer being out and being allowed freedom. However, in 2019, after serving 45 years, over double his minimum term, 68-year-old David McGreevy was released from prison on licence. He must abide by strict rules, including having a curfew, and he is barred from returning to Worcester. If he breaks any of these conditions or any of his other rules, he should immediately be recalled back to prison. The news of David's release was heartbreaking and angering for Elsie. You think I'm feeling terrible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is this was the morning you've been dreading, isn't it? It is. It's still not fair that he's been released for what he's done. They're saying he was going in for life, and they're saying he's been released for what he's done. They're saying he was going in for life, and then they changed it to 20 years. But he hasn't done the 60 years. He took three lives, not just one or two, three. And yeah. also, he's took my life, really. You know, there's other prisoners in there. What happened? And after that, is what he's done to my children. And yet they haven't been put up for parole, so what's made him be able to get parole? Anger, I suppose, a lot of it was, to think that they had let him go. After all the fighting I've been doing to keep him in, if this happened to one of those people on the parole board, would they even think about releasing him? Would he even still be alive to be released? So why? Because there's other people as well in the prisons. I know they might have killed somebody, but not in the state that he done my children in. And they haven't been put up for parole, so why is he? After the murder of their children, Elsie never returned back to the house and both she and Clive went to live with family separately. Clive moved in with his parents and Elsie with her sister. Elsie's mental health plummeted and their marriage deteriorated and eventually they would divorce. It broke her, where I was into such a state and I had... I tried to commit suicide because I couldn't be coping with it and I was on such a high dosage of sedation from the doctors to try and get me through to see. And my husband came to me one day and he just said he couldn't cope with it anymore and he was putting him for a divorce. 
I couldn't find much about Clive's life following this. Elsie would remarry, but she had no more children. She couldn't even bear to be around other people's children because it hurt so much. She would think of Paul, Dawn and Samantha and wonder, who would they have become? What would they look like? Where would they be now? Would they be married? Would she be a grandmother? All questions that she will never get the answers to. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave me a review and a follow. I would appreciate that so much. You can follow the podcast over on Instagram at True Crime Caitlin Pod, where I'll be posting all of the images relating to all of the cases and for any updates. Make sure you tune in again next week for a brand new episode.